Hi, I'm Grace Fishenbell. I taught at Brentwood High School for 20 years. Part of the time I was at Ross Building, and part of the time I was in Sondling, and I enjoyed 18 of those years. <laughs> My first two years, I think I was almost a basket case. But I had the help of my colleagues. The art department was very helpful. And there were a few people in the home economics department who were very, very supportive. Phyllis Beyer taught me how to put a roll book together, how to put the, the names in 20 week segments. And so I had the tools to start working. Who named you, Grace? My mother was an Anglophile. My sister's name is Edith. My cousin's name is Joyce. We have a Lester, a Spencer, and I became Grace. They had to be American English type names because my mother was trying to be middle class or upper middle class. And she thought that kind of naming would put us in a different financial and ethnic category. But my name was also Graysala, and Grace became Graysala by my grandma and grandpa who lived downstairs. And that's how I That was, was going to be my next question, if you had a nickname, and sure enough, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what is your current, and, and uh, of course, we know what it is, but for the audience, what's your present family situation? Where are you living, and who, is, who are you living with, and what's going on? I was not ready to retire from Brentwood. 20 years was not really enough for me, but it was enough for Bernie, my husband. He retired ahead of me and had a position at the Board of Education in New York City as the acting director of music. When he saw that I hit the 20th year of teaching, he knew that I was eligible for retirement. So he said, that's it. We live in Florida and we get an apartment in, in Great Neck near Key, but we split our time. We become Florida citizens, residents, and we spend five months in Great Neck and seven months in Boca Raton. And Keith, your son is My here. son lives in Great Neck with his family, his good wife, Cheryl, who allows Keith the time to play and runs the family. <laughs> And my daughter, Randy, who is a musician, ex-attorney, but a full-time musician in Florida, South Florida. Randy is her name. And she lives there. And she She's, lives there, yes. yes. Now, Keith uh, also has a child, and you have a grand, you have two. So talk about that. Okay. We are lucky enough to have two grandchildren. Jessica, the firstborn, was a, is a wonderful child. She's a gift. She was always adorable. And three years after she was born came Andrew, who is Superman. He is handsome and kind and good and loves his sister. He really is amazing. He's a good boy. He's the most gentle, caring, ethical young boy, while Jessica is also caring and good to her brother and to her father and mother, but she has a great talent. She just got a scholarship to the opera and theater program at New York University. Jessica is 17 and a half and Andrew is 14. Sounds like 17 and a half going on 30 with her experience Jessica, and her gift. Yeah. Jessica has learned a great deal and she's had 
good boyfriends who have introduced her to good literature and cultural things. It's good to have good friends. Her girlfriends are good. Uh, one of her friends is joining her at uh, the theater program at NYU. Uh, and so she'll have a buddy. <clears throat> She's going to be living there in the city. Bernie went to NYU, but when Bernie went to NYU, he commuted from Blake Avenue in Brooklyn to New York University School of Education. Jessica is going to live in the dorm and get a very fancy treatment from the family. And she's allowed to stay in Manhattan. That's where she is. There, there are definitely family traits and talents that are showing themselves again in this next generation of their days. I mean, uh, there are not alone Bernie's talents, but your talents seem to be uh, uh, very present in your grandchildren, as well as your own children. Well, let's see. Keith uh, grew up with music. He was the first born. And <clears throat> to practice was part of our lives, Randy also. There was no such thing as coming home from school and watching television because that was very limited in our family. You could watch television for about an hour in your room, but what you had to do was practice your instrument and Keith played the trumpet and studied with some very good teachers while Randy played the violin and studied with Bernie. <clears throat> and when she auditioned, when she went to use Dan as summer camp and auditioned for their orchestra, she came home and told us when she was nine years old, I am second to the worst violinist in the whole camp. I need a good teacher. So we got her a good teacher and Bernie was fired. He was a trumpet player. And so we got her a really good teacher, a man by the name of Sylvan Schulman, who taught at the Juilliard Prep School. And Randy became a, a good violinist, which, which interfered with her law, <laughs> the occupation of law. When she didn't like what she was doing, she took her fiddle out and went to play and was hired wherever she went. And that's what she does for a living. With a law degree. Well, her law degree is there. Yes. It's in a drawer. It's in a drawer. It's not even hanging on the wall. The diploma was put in her car and it rained. And the law, the diploma, every beautiful diploma is all rain spotted and crummy but it, she earned it. <laughs> now, Keith is also very talented with his hands and it, visually. He does some beautiful work, but he also is a musician. Well, the music stayed with the kids. Keith was a, an art education major at New Falls. He, uh, we really wanted him to be a dentist. <laughs> And we were very successful with our children. Our training really led. That's why I really needed Bobby Frankel. Bobby Frankel used to help me when I became frustrated with the way my great plans, educational plans for my children went. Bobby Frankel would welcome me into his office and give me tissues right away. And so I can tell you, the gifts that we offered the children that were unofficial, they became the official way of life for both of them. Music became very important. And art, Keith, Keith did not believe that I loved teaching. His, his, uh, his experience at student teaching was that he walked in, in Kingston, New York, and he introduced himself. He said, hi. My name is Keith. He didn't say I'm Mr. Fischenfeld, your new teacher. Hi, my name is Keith. I'm your new art teacher. So the kids listened to him and one boy said, 
hi Keith, and opened the door and disappeared and said, bye Keith. Well, he learned that you should be more formal, but he didn't realize that you can be more formal. You could be an adult with children and they you can earn their respect and still be friendly. But he never got to that stage. He did not like teaching. He opened a jewelry shop. He majored in gold and silversmithing. He, and he did do very well with uh, certain competitions. He entered the Diamonds Are Forever competition with De Beers. And he was a finalist in, uh, in London with his engagement ring diamond design. And Keith has had a good following yeah. for all the years that he's been in business. Yeah. And on Thursday night, he takes his trumpet and invites musicians into his shop and they play in the shop and in the street. Yeah. And every note that he knows, Keith is the jazz jeweler. Yeah. And that's, Wonderful. and his wife lets him do this. When I say lets him do this, she doesn't give him other obligations. She runs the family and he plays his trumpet and runs the business. That's a great story. What, what are some of your personal, your earliest memories as a child? Well, we had a porcelain, a white porcelain kitchen table. In, of course, in the, in the kitchen, we had this white porcelain table with little blue diamonds around it, but there was enough white on the table to take a pencil. And after dinner, my mother would clear the table and my father, my sister and I would take a pencil and draw on the kitchen table, my father included. He loved to draw American Indians. And so we would do scenes of American Indians with a pencil and draw until we filled the whole table. And then my mother took banami, which was a kind of scouring powder. And she said, are you finished? And then she'd wash the whole table. And it was again, a clear white kitchen table. What was your mother's maiden name? Lepofsky. My mother was Lepofsky. And your maiden name? Goldberg. My father's came from the Goldberg family, which was another name originally. The name was Zenzelski. But on the boat coming over from Russia, the agent asked my grandfather for his name, Hyman, and my grandfather told him it was Zenzelski. He says, what is that with a D or a Z? So he says, I don't know. He didn't know a D or a Z. He says, okay, your name is Goldberg. From then on, we were Goldberg. We don't know, I don't know how to spell Zenzelski, and nobody uses the name Zenzelski. He had 13 children, they were all Goldberg. Did, do you know anything about family history on either side, Grace? About my grandmother and father, your mother or your father's. Family. Oh, of course. My uh, grandfather came from Russia. He learned to speak and write English immediately. He moved upstate New York, where he got a real estate broker's stamp. Of course, I saw Hyman Goldberg real estate, and he bought a farm. And he opened a place called the Swan Lake Inn, which became the Swan Lake Hotel, where he, proud, <laughs> where he proudly walked around with a white linen suit, white patent leather shoes, a white Panama hat, a, 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 a watch, a gold watch in his pocket while his wife cooked in the kitchen and his 13 children did the plumbing, the painting, drove the carriage to the uh, railroad station, picked up guests, and prepared all the labor for for the for the paying guests. And my grandma was what was called a schlaf, which is a slave, while my grandfather was the king, and he treated his children 
as workers. And that was as much as he we recall. He lost his fortune when he was digging for a gorgeous swimming pool for the Swan Lake Hotel, and they had money problems and engineering problems uh, to find the water to work with the, to filling mm -hmm. that pool. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather then became a visitor for where uh, my, after my grandmother passed away, he would come and visit each child and each child gave him a meal and two dollars. Mm. But I thought he was an elegant man. Now, coming, this is your paternal grandfather. My father's father. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. They had respect, but they did not have great love. But they knew that he needed the support yeah. and they gave him, each child gave him a meal money and he went back to his little room in Manhattan, a rented room. He fell from a very high place. What about on the on the, your my mother? mother. Yeah, your mother my said. mother had the most loving parents. They lived downstairs from us. My grandmother came six years after came to this country, six years after my grandfather came, arrived. My grandfather was a fun man. He what was, year would that have been? Grace? Oh God, this is uh, really? let's see. My grandmother was my mother was born in nineteen oh six, and they came about nine years, mm -hmm. ten years before that. Mm -hmm. So what? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Thank you. Ten years yeah. before that, mm -hmm. and uh, my grandpa couldn't call for my grandmother because he never found a location for a job. So my grandmother was a wonderful dressmaker and she started to sew clothing for people. She had a little boy and my uncle Sam came over with my grandma with the money that she earned from sewing from people. And she came steerage with my grandpa with a little bag of food that was kosher, and she didn't want to eat anything on the ship. And my grandfather, my grand, my my uncle Sam, who was the child of that union, uh, was very hungry. He was already six years old, and he found a seaman who gave him money, uh, gave him food, and he brought it to my grandmother. And my grandmother said, "I can't eat it, Sammy. I can't eat it." So Sam said, Uncle Sam said, Mama, Mama, don't worry if it's good, it's kosher. And that's the way he lived the rest of his life. He was pragmatic. He knew that in order to survive, you should adapt. And my uncle went to medical school. My, he found a good neighborhood also. He lived in East New York, Brooklyn, and he was delivering meat, uh, working for a butcher, and he found Flatbush on his bike. And he saw Erasmus High School in a courtyard. And he said, that's a good school. I wanna go to that school. So he lied about where he lived. People didn't question him, I don't know how, but he knocked himself out and he rode his bicycle to another neighborhood and graduated from Flatbush Erasmus Hall High School and went on to college and was a very successful man. He did marry before he graduated from, well, he, while he was in medical school. And so he had to drop out and became a pharmacist and opened a, a drugstore in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn and raised a lovely family. Now, talking about family again, were you, you weren't an only child, were you? No, I had a sister. My and sister Edith was six and a half years older than me. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from watching my sister and her relationship with my mother. Wow. And I learned, I learned how to be more private than my poor sister. My sister was completely dominated by my mother's good wishes. She gave her piano lessons. 
elocution lessons, but I learned a lot from her. I learned that I could go downstairs where my grandma and grandpa lived and enjoy their stories and always say, thank you, mom, very good, and do what I wanted to do. <laughs> and she never, she, she was fine with it. Did your mother and your father come from large families or did they come from small families? My mother had only one brother. One brother. My father had 12 brothers and sisters. Oh. Well, my grandfather That's needed right. all those he children work, to run his workers. business. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your mother's brother was the Sam. Person. Sam so, is the mm -hmm. one who, who became very American. Yeah. Uh -huh. He played golf. His girls, his two girls, uh, had, wore jodhpurs. They rode horses in Prospect Park. And his son, Marvin, became a doctor. Completed what he didn't complete, what his dad did. Who were the... Who, besides your immediate family, who were the adult influences in your life that had a profound effect? Upon I had you? a great teacher. I had several. My teachers were very okay. important. Mm -hmm. Also, the Biltmore Movie Theater, <laughs> where my mother took me about three times a week to see all these glamorous movies. Well, my first language was English with an English accent. Because really, when you go to old movies, you learn to speak that way. And when I was six years old, I thought that was proper English. And until I learned, and a little Jewish, Yiddish, I spoke Yiddish and English with American with an English accent. And then I straightened out and I began to speak like everybody else in East New York. How did how did you decide on the career choice you made? Who was it? The, who was the mentor there? Who was the influence? In kindergarten, there? I was sitting around on a beautiful little chair, and because I had this older sister who who had friends over, and we used to draw all the time. My father did that too. I drew. I must have been very advanced for a little girl because they took me out of kindergarten to select the paintings for the hallway. I remember I had an, uh, a principal who took me out to make all the selections for what they were going to hang on the walls because I was a very good little artist. So I remember that from kindergarten on. And of course I had great teachers. I have a mm. very favorite one later on. Do, do, you remember, do you remember? Ella Jackson. Name? Ella Jackson. Jackson, of course. Ella Jackson uh, was my high school art teacher who told us that we had to go into Manhattan at least twice a month and look around and see the way people dressed and acted and go to the Museum of Modern Art. Ella was like there was a movie called The Prime of Jean Brody, yes. who was a very fine yes. teacher yes. who felt that the children had to be lifted from their narrow environments and exposed to the glamorous upper class world. Well, Ella felt that way. While she was a political leftist, she did want us to learn how to be in the world of knowledge. So she asked a few of the girls to make sure to report to her about our trips to the galleries, the museums, from fifth term high school on. And she also took my artwork and mailed it to the National Academy and to uh, Washington, the museums, in, uh, a museum in Washington. And she, she taught me about wood, woodcut prints. And she framed my work and sent it out to be in the competitions. And I got in. I mm -hmm. got into some very fine adult competitions mm -hmm. when I was very young in high school because of Ella Jackson. So these kinds of uh, the, your after school interests then very much included going to museums and 
yes, that was that was definite. I had to get dressed and go into the city with the girls that I met from my high school art class and do that. I also was taking voice lessons. I was a singer. Oh. <laughs> I my mother dragged me because she loved all that kind of thing. She dragged me to the Horn and Harder Children's Hour where I was, Gracie Goldberg. And it was less work for mothers for Horn and Harder, the Children's Hour. And there I sang and got nauseous on the, on the train and hated it. But my mother loved it because I was then an entertainer. And she, went, she always meant well. Yes. But it really clashed with my feelings. Yeah. I loved doing artwork because I didn't have to perform in public. Wow. What were you, maybe you answered this by, by indirection, but your favorite subjects in school were, were your art classes, obviously. Art and, and English composition and literature and history. Okay. I was terrible in math. I couldn't yeah. figure out what. Uh, when my parent, when my grandparents came eight years before uh, this and this and that, yeah. because I have to count on my fingers. So it was not math. About family again, I wanted to ask you, did you have uh, a favorite holiday? Or was there an important holiday in the family every year? One that you really saw? My grandmother. My grandmother let us, we would hang our stockings up at Christmas time, where we hung the dish towels. We didn't, we did have a fireplace. It didn't get hung near the fireplace. It was a fake fireplace. Our stockings hung where you hang kitchen towels to dry. And we hung our stockings and grandma crept up the steps and put money Hanukkah guilt in our Christmas stockings. Okay. Okay. That was holiday. That's, that's adapted. Yes. Okay. You have the opportunity now of living both in Great Neck, Long Island, and in Florida. But when you were younger, did you have a favorite season that differs from your favorite season today? I really don't. Okay. And everything seemed very marvelous. The changes okay. are very welcoming. Is there an aroma of food, particularly grapes, that triggers a memory for you? Are you talking about food? Food. Is there a is there food a food has been my friend and enemy through my life? I I I I I, Does, I don't think there's a food that I that don't triggers, like. Is there a food that triggers a memory, memory of childhood? my grandmother? Oh yeah. Well, I know that if you bake apples with cinnamon, your whole house smells good. And, and, and I do. I do that. Especially when I usually do it when I'm having guests. I like to bake apples with cinnamon. It makes everything so lovely. You mentioned a teacher that was very important to you before. Would you take us through all the schools that you attended throughout your life from the first school? I went to PS 72 across the street from a reformed Dutch church. There were wonderful teachers who made us do a victory garden. And in the little patch of land in front of New Lots Avenue, that's where New Lots Avenue in Brooklyn, where PS 72 was, it was one of the oldest elementary schools in Brooklyn. Then when that building got torn down, I was in fourth grade, I transferred to another school, PS 182 on Wyona Street. And I, it took me a while to really love that school because PS 72 was a remarkable place. They told us about the early Dutch settlers in New, on New Lots. And across the street from that PS 72 was the old Skank, which was a Dutch a, a res preserved cottage, and that, and there were cobblestones in the street, and and the, the the thought about the early settlers in New York were, were with me when I went to that school. Of course, the 
street still had cobblestones in my neighborhood, but I moved to a more modern building, PS 182, where I stayed until sixth grade. And then I went to junior high school, 149 on Sutter Avenue in Brooklyn, where Danny Kay graduated from. And then I wanted to go to major in art. So I went to Prospect Heights High School near across the street from the Brooklyn Museum where we took class uh, at the Botanical Gardens, which was also within walking distance. And I had a marvelous high school, all girls school, which was fine because I did have my boyfriend, Bernie, at the time, and I had no need for a co-ed school. Uh, Bernie was in Brooklyn, my, a neighbor, and Mike, who became my husband, who I met when I was 16 years old. Um, you know what I didn't ask you before, Grace, which you just occurred to me? I didn't ask you uh, when you were born and where you were born. You were in, in Brooklyn? 1932, Jewish Hospital in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. What part of Brooklyn was that? In East New York was that? Well, I lived in East New York, but I think Jewish Hospital was like near Crown Heights. Okay, so you, but you lived at that Brooklyn. family. Lived. Brooklyn. Okay. Mm -hmm. I thought that that was where creation okay. existed. Yeah, yeah, sure. They had the Dodges. Sure. I lived in Brooklyn. I thought I was a very lucky person. Mm -hmm. Now, when you finished, when you graduated high school, you then went to, you continued where? Where did you go to school? I had such good high school teachers. That carried me into Brentwood High School. I wanted to do for other kids what was done for me. They prepared me for knowing where to apply for scholarships. My father was a house painter. He was sick. My mother went to work as a sewing machine operator in the neighborhood. They had no time to tell me what applications to fill out. My teachers did that. My teachers told me about something called the School Art League which was uh, an association of businessmen from Brooklyn who supported talented art students. And so I won a four-year scholarship to Parsons School of Design, where I went when I graduated. There I stayed for a, a, for a, a, a year, and I didn't like the way they were training us, so I left. I left my scholarship and they made me bring my parents up because I was giving up a very marvelous advantage. But I left because I was a foolish child. I felt that my high school training was more advanced than what I was, than what I was getting in, in the college at Parsons School of Design at that time. And I had already had life classes with the nude model female model at Prospect Heights. And I felt that they were slowing me down and I left. But when I left, my mother said, now you have to get a job. You cannot stay home and do nothing. So I got a job in a comic book factory and I found out that it was better to go to school it was tough to be in this kind of um, environment where people were really sweating it out. Association uh, of Women Artists and the Carl Springs Artists Guild and the Florida Watercolor Society and the Palm Beach Watercolor Society. I just work all the time. You are. My yes. students said to me, Fior Delisa Espanol said to me, I know you were waiting for me to graduate and your career is waiting. It's your turn now, Mrs. Fish. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Well, yeah. And how true it is because you haven't let any moss grow at all. I mean, I'm, you, you enjoying, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying. How, how many, total number of years, 20? Did you say 20 years? I taught for 20 years. <laughs> 
and your beginning salary before taxes. God knows, but I have to tell you. You don't remember? No. Honestly? I oh, you're the first person who has to think about that. wonderful. No. About six? God no, I don't know. Okay. It was helpful. Yes. And I have to tell you how grateful I am. I, I'm not... Yes. I am so grateful to Brentwood and their and the union and everything that we've got, our benefits. I was very 1972 was the last year for all complete benefits. And I came in just then. Mm. If you believe mm. in any higher yes. power, yes. that was a marvelous yeah. thing. On tier one. So tier yeah, one. Right. So Grace, I have, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to accomplish what we're going to aim for in the few minutes that remain. Um, so bear with me if I shoot through some of these rather quick. Yeah, shoot. Is there anything that you would have done differently as far as your career, your teaching career? Is there anything that if hadn't, having had a chance to do it all, you would have done differently? No, no, no. I stepped okay. into good things. Okay. Uh, what do you miss? From those years. I met such good people. I really did. They were, oh, man. Tex is gone. Yeah. There are people who are no longer around. Mm -hmm. I miss them. Mm -hmm. and But I still have some of my students. Yes. I've got, I'm you still, still in touch. Contact. Oh, yeah. Yes. I have a few kids who I still right. write to, hear from. And, and some see. who have gone on to achieve great oh, things. Oh yes, marvelous yes. things. I know there are so many stories I could I could extract from you if we had more time. Uh, what, what what do you wish you could have accomplished that you didn't have either time or resources to do? Is there anything that was left undone when when you said goodbye? I felt very complete. That's I felt good. To be able to say. Now, this is a generalization, but you had 20 years of experience there, and I'm going to ask you uh, to complete each of these statements. How would you, what word or words would you use to complete this, the phrase, Brentwood's teachers are? Hardworking, achieving people, good comrades, good friends. Supportive and Brentwood students are special. They have a lot of things splitting their lives. They have economic pressures. They live a little bit far away from New York City. They can't do my Higher Horizons program that was given to me to get into New York City and look around. That was a nice thing to do. I don't know what they find. I don't know what they find now. They directed me to St. Patrick's Cathedral when I was in high school. Look at the beauty. Look at this. Look at that. It's hard to do that. They can't. They can't simulate what what uh, the kind of uh, New York City that I saw, because I lived very close to New York. It's expensive to go from Brentwood into New York. They can't run to the Museum of Modern Art. It's hard. It's expensive. But I found that once these youngsters get into college, my kids, my youngsters, stuck to it. They were like the weeds that grow through the cracks of the pavement. They hung in there. My students who went to college and art school graduated and found great careers. And they were, not spoiled. Well, they were not spoiled. They were not spoiled children. Say, is there any advice that you could offer to somebody who might be just entering the field now or coming up? Have patience. Mm -hmm. Have patience and be willing to learn and be open to criticism. Yes. And, and it doesn't mean so anybody, you don't know everything yes. when you walk into a job. You have to look around and listen to your colleagues and feel the tempo of your kids students and have patience. Did you have a favorite year, Grace, of all of them? No, I, I really don't. Okay. Now, is there anything that we neglected or we forgot about that we want to say before we finish? 
there were so many students whose names I loved. There were kids who were so courageous and found careers. I wish I could tell you about them. They're wonderful stories, boys and girls, who were, for the most part, quite alone in their discoveries. In other words, uh, their academic achievements were not particularly understood by their parents who were new to the country and, and struggling. It wasn't a stupid question that was asked of me, how do you feel about the ethnicity of the, the students? It did mean something. You had to understand that there were many people learning a lot of things and, and you are one as a beginning person. Sure. sure. Grace Fischenfeld, thank you so much I'm for so giving up your time generously and uh, uh, I, I hope that you will enjoy watching this yourself. <laughs> okay. Was hard work. Uh, I at, within a year I oh, I found out about State Tech, which was a community college, a two-year community college, and I immediately applied. And they were marvelous. They looked at my portfolio from high school and whatever I learned at Parsons, and they took me without renewing an exam. And there I completed my associate's degree. And I got a job in an advertising agency immediately. Uh, first eight weeks was working in what they call a bullpen, where you do paste lay. Well, no, you don't do the layouts. You do paste ups for the art director's layouts. And I did that. And then they turned me into an art director. We advertised books, and I did Harper Mysteries. I was in charge of that, and I did that. For two years, I was married and then helped Bernie go to college. And uh, that's what I did until I became pregnant with my first child. I returned to school after many years and I went to, uh, I returned to get, I went to Nassau Community College, and then to Malloy College for Catholic Women, where they were marvelous. They took all my credits, and I completed my undergrad education from Malloy College, and I then applied for teaching at uh, Brentwood. And before we talk about Brentwood, which we're going to do next, I forgot to ask you something else. Do you remember the first job for which you were paid? Yeah. What was it? Oh, uh, summer job when there wasn't school at Parsons when I finished my first year. I got a job in a doll factory painting the eyes and lips. I'm holding my hand this way because I had to put the doll's heads, take it off a rack, put the doll's heads on, paint their eyeballs, paint their lips, and put them back. That's what I did my first job. It was a factory. Okay. And then you came to Brentwood in what year would that have been? 1972, Brentwood. And on the life. third day of school. On the third day. My son's art teacher was a a friend of Frank Lurch's. Frank Lurch, the art department chair, had mentioned that a young man came to be interviewed at Brentwood High School for the job of teaching art. And he didn't like it. He left on the first day of school he said he had a better offer, upstate New York. He didn't want to be in Brentwood. So I was told about it, and I phoned, and they arranged for an interview for me. And Mr. Yankowski, Manny Vega, and Frank Lurch were there for my interview. And that was my first experience with teaching 
in the high school of Brentwood. And the interview went strangely. Tell me about that. They were busy telling me about the, the ethnicity of Brentwood. And I forgot to mention that while I was going to school, I was also teaching in a community center, a Y. For 12 years I did that while going to school and raising children and doing little things to bring money into the family and to do what I could do in my community. I taught at the East, at the East New York Y and at, uh, at uh, the Mid-Island Y in Wantua. And they asked me all about how I felt about teaching children of, this, of different ethnicities. And it was getting in the way of my plans to teach. So I said, could you please excuse me? I, I really don't care about the ethnicity of the, of the kids. I'm busy thinking of what I'm going to teach tomorrow. Uh, I, I'll find out about the kids, but I have to know what I'm going, I have to plan about what I'm going to do for you tomorrow. Well, I did get hired and it did matter. I did have to learn how to work at Brentwood. They were, it was a different tone from teaching in, in uh, the East New York Y and at uh, 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 Wantour. Our kids were very, very interested in the way they looked and their shoes and wanting to get ahead with material things. I noticed. That's what I noticed right away. And what I was teaching in art was not really necessarily their prime motivation for, for existence. When I was teaching art in a community center, it, they came because they wanted to do art. And so the motivation for these kids were very different. They came into my class because they wanted to get finished with their day of school and get out and get their second, get their jobs to buy gorgeous little sneakers and cars. That's what I think I found out. So for two years, I had to figure out how to reach these kids and tell them about how important it is, what I was giving, what I wanted to give them. And it really took me two years of, of, of figuring out how to reach our Brentwood kids. You know what I'd like to ask you, Grace, is to give us an overview, uh, if you can, with who you worked in the first couple of years, some of the people that you worked with. Oh, yes, I'll tell you right away. The one who saved me and turned me into a tuned-in teacher was Tex Blassett's, Margaret Blassett's. She said to me, Grace, how old are you? I said, I'm 40. She said, where did you teach before? She was very helpful. I was dreaming about teaching them art on, uh, on a cloud. And Margaret Blassett's, Ted Bl Tex Blassett's was a down to earth teacher. She'd say, come here, squat knuckle. She would say to the kids, hold this pen this way. This is the way you do it. And she got down to business and, and straightened these kids out and taught them a kind of structure and had fun and managed. What she did for me was teach me how to get my supplies together, box my lessons so that when the bell rang and another class came in, I was able to pull all my supplies out and be ready to teach the next class and never be unprepared. Tex taught me that. She said, this is a battlefield. If you're unprepared, you will get killed. Really, educationally slaughtered. You have to show the kids you're ready for them, you're prepared, and that's why lesson plans were helpful. Everything was good. The structure was good. And that's where I was with the help of text. Now, the grades you've taught, the subjects you've taught, and the positions or promotions that you may have received, I, I'm going to group all this together, and you can tell me anything you want to about it. 
uh, the, the various activities and programs that you were involved in? I taught drawing and painting, design, three-dimensional design, learned a lot from text, and advertising, because I was in advertising. Sure. I worked for that 4A agency, and I team taught with my chairman, Frank Lurch, who was a charming man and enjoyed the kids as much as I did. Did, did uh, your preparation professionally to be a teacher uh, prepare you for what you found when you got to Brentwood? Or I that... went to beautiful Malloy who told us that they came from St. Dominic, who was an educator, who was an intellectual, high-minded, wonderful. They said, listen, get rid of grades. Get rid of grades. There should be nothing higher than the feeling of self-accomplishment. I walked into Bullock, I walked into Brentwood with that mindset. And I quickly learned that if you don't pay with grades, they don't know what they are. So that beautiful idea of self-nourishment from high achievement sort of floated out of the window. And when that floated out of the window within my first two years, I learned that you get a, a shirt for your ticket. You give them your grade and they will work to achieve it. And I had to do that well, old fashioned type this, of this thing. This question comes from what you're answering now. And you knew that the question was coming, I'm sure, uh, because it has to do with your, uh, your purpose in the classroom having less to do with a job description than it had to do with why you saw yourself being there in the first place. What were you trying to accomplish? Oh, I wanted to give these kids what I got, the chance to elevate, the chance to take a peek into a more affluent world where you could live more easily, where you can enjoy economically and intellectually the creative part of making a society. I had this wonderful Ella Jackson who did this yes. in high school yeah. for me and other teachers who did it also. And I really, aside from the fact that it certainly helped my family yes. economically to work and, and have a, a salary, I really loved going in with the idea <laughs> that I was able to get these kids from high school into a college, into a field that they could live in and earn yes. and have a good life. I'm going to ask you some questions about your continuing connection with former colleagues and so on, but I'll hold that off because I'd rather at this point ask, was there ever a time where you were involved with the Brentwood Teachers Association or with the, with the former? They were doing program? very well. Okay. And I really wasn't involved. Okay. I do know that Edie, there was a, a woman who represented us in the union, she was a good woman. And uh, if I had a problem about uh, a procedure, I knew she was there. And uh, there were good people doing the job in the union for us. Were you, Grace, were you ever afraid to go to work in Brentwood? No. 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 I didn't think you were going to say that. What, professionally, what has made you angry? I support the public schools. And it hurts me to think, look, I may have the idea of charter schools all wrong, but I like the public institution being supported. And I don't like to see funds wiped away and put into a private area where the hard work that teachers unions worked for for so long become diminished. Mm -hmm. Salary schedules right. and certain rules, certain benefits that we've gotten, I don't like to see that diminished. 
and standards for uh, achieving uh, higher uh, points for continued education uh, not recognized. Uh, I, I don't like to see competition in the public school world with other systems that might take away from the ability. Or the resources. Or the resources, exactly. Here we are in uh, August of 09, and looking back at your official date of retirement, which was what? 1992, 20 years after my teaching uh, at the hired in 70. I am so happy that we finally made a date to do this because it's been a long time that I wanted to do it. You've been a very busy lady since 92 because we retired in the same year. In that time, you've accomplished so much, Grace. What of the things that you've accomplished are you most proud of? Uh, well, when Bernie said it's time to retire, Grace, and I really didn't want to, I started to look to find fault with my position at, at Brentwood, and I was getting a little cranky when Tom Oliveri said to me, when I stayed late framing some of the work for a show, and I was grumbling, he said, go home, Grace, I see you're cranky. And I was thinking, I really don't want to retire. That's really why I'm cranky. And Bernie said, Grace, it's time to go to Florida. I, and I said, I really am not ready. And he said, well, then I'll miss you in Florida. So I said, oh boy, uh, I guess I have to go. So I did. And what I did right away was read an article. I found an article in a, in a Florida newspaper about a group of artists called Women in the Visual Arts, group of women artists. And I called up and I got connected with them immediately. This group of women artists do work in the community. That satisfied me. They were not only artists, but they provided scholarships to high school kids and college women, high school boys and girls, but graduate women artists going to complete their master's degrees. I became the chair of uh, that committee, the Graduate Education Committee uh, okay. organization committee. That's what I became the, the, the uh, chair of. And I do that today. I work with women in the visual arts and we do find women who are in need, who are talented and in need uh, of funds to get their master's degree completed. I also belong to the Boca Museum Artist Skills, where we have a cooperative art gallery and I show there regularly. Compete to show mm -hmm. there, you have to compete. And I belong to um, the National Association of Women Artists and the Carl Springs Artist Guild and the Florida Water Cole Society and the Palm Beach Water Cole Society. I just work all the time. You are. My right. students said to me, Fior Delisa Espanol said to me, I know you were waiting for me to graduate and your career is waiting. It's your turn now, Mrs. Fish. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And how true it is because you haven't let any moss grow at all. I mean, I'm, you, you enjoying, I'm enjoying it. How, how many total number of years? 20? Did you say 20 years? I taught for 20 <clears> years. <throat> and your beginning salary before taxes? God knows, but I have to tell you. You don't remember? No. Honestly? I oh, you're the first person who has it. Six That's wonderful. Uh, About six? Oh, okay. I, know. I don't know. Okay. It was helpful. Yes. And I have to tell you how grateful I am. I, I'm not... Yes. Do, I am so grateful to Brentwood and their and the union and everything that we've got, our benefits. I was very nineteen seventy two was the last year for all complete benefits and I came in just then. Mm. If you believe mm. in any higher yes. power yes. that was a marvelous yeah. thing. On tier one, so tier yeah, one. Right. So Grace, I Grace, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to accomplish what we're going to aim for in the few minutes that remain. 
Um, so bear with me if I shoot through some of these rather quick. Yeah, shoot. Is there anything that you would have done differently as far as your career, your teaching career? Is there anything that if had in, having had a chance to do it all you would have done differently? No, no, no. I stepped okay. into good things. Okay. Uh, what do you miss from those years? I met such good people. I really did. They were, oh, man. Tex is gone. Yeah. There are people who are no longer around. Mm -hmm. I miss them. Mm -hmm. and, but I still have some of my students. Yes. I've got... I'm you still, still in touch. Contact. Oh yeah, yes. I have a few kids who I still right. write to, hear from, and, and some see. who have gone on to achieve great oh, things. Oh yes, marvelous yes. things. I know there are so many stories I could I could extract from you if we had more time. Uh, what but what do you wish you could have accomplished that you didn't have either time or resources to do? Is there anything that was left undone when when you said goodbye? I felt very complete. I That's felt good. To be able to say. Now, this is a generalization, but you had 20 years of experience there, and I'm going to ask you uh, to complete each of these statements. How would you, what word or words would you use to complete this, the phrase, Brentwood's teachers are? Hardworking, achieving people, Good comrades, good friends, supportive. And Brentwood students are? Special. They have a lot of things splitting their lives. They have economic pressures. They live a little bit far away from New York City. They can't do my Higher Horizons program that was given to me to get into New York City and look around. That was a nice thing to do. I don't know what they find. I don't know what they find now. They directed me to St. Patrick's Cathedral when I was in high school. Look at the beauty, look at this, look at that. It's hard to do that. They can't They can't simulate what, what uh, the kind of uh, New York City that I saw because I live very close to New York. It's expensive to go from Brentwood into New York. They can't run to the Museum of Modern Art. It's hard, it's expensive. But I found that once these youngsters get into college, my kids, my youngsters, stuck to it. They were like the weeds that grow through the cracks of the pavement. They hung in there. My students, who went to college and art school, graduated and found great careers. And they what were not spoiled. Wonderful. They were not spoiled yeah, children. Say, wonderful. Is there any advice that you could offer to somebody who might be just entering the field now or coming up? Have patience. Mm -hmm. Have patience and be willing to learn and be open to criticism. And, yes. and it doesn't mean so anybody, you don't know everything yes. when you walk into a job. You have to look around and listen to your colleagues and feel the tempo of your students and have patience. Did you have a favorite year, Grace, of all of them? No, I, I really don't. Okay. Now, is there anything that we neglected or we forgot about that we want to say before we there were so many students whose names I love. There were kids who were so courageous and found careers. I wish I could tell you about them. They're wonderful stories, boys and girls, who were, for the most part, quite alone in their discoveries. In other words, uh, their academic achievements were not particularly understood by their parents who were new to the country and, and struggling. It wasn't a stupid question that was asked of me, how do you feel about the ethnicity of the, the students? It did mean something. You had to understand that there were many people learning a lot of things and, and you are one as a beginning person. Sure. sure. Grace Bishop, thank you so much. 
I'm for giving so over your time generously, and uh, uh, I I hope that you will enjoy watching this yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs>